Good morning. It's wonderful to see all these wonderful faces out here this morning, ready to worship the Lord. If you would please stand with me this morning as we uh, start the morning off with a reading of Scripture. Reading from Lamentations 3, verse 22 this morning. Through the, excuse me, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in Him. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him. The soul who seeks Him, it is good that one should hope and wait quiet, quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? All right, let's continue this morning's worship by uh, singing to the Lord. Father, Lord, we come to you this morning just ever thankful for um, what you did for us on that cross, Lord. Without that, we would be just uh, destined for, for, for eternal damnation. Lord, we thank you for that life-giving, that eternal life-giving sacrifice that you gave for us, Lord. And Lord, we pray that this morning would all be about you, Lord, that we just grow closer to you, that we come to know you better, Lord. We thank you and just give you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's greet one another in the love of the Lord this morning. seats. We have some announcements this morning. Uh, starting off with uh, tomorrow, the church office will be closed for Labor Day, and it will reopen as normal on Tuesday. All right, home groups. Have you found a home group uh, to be part of? I, uh, I really recommend it if you, uh, if you have that time and that chance. It's really a great time to, 
grow some relationships with other believers in the faith, and uh, I really recommend it. And we have a few home groups. Uh, our Denaire home group meets at the home of Bob and Kathy Monroe every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Our Empire home group meets at the home of John and Jamie Milani every Tuesday night at 7 p.m., and our new Turlock home group will kick off, <coughs> will kick off at uh, Pastor Dan and Cynthia uh, Soini's house here in Turlock, um, and all adults are welcome to attend, so I expect to see every one of you guys there. Love to fill up their house, you know. Um, that will meet every Wednesday at 7 p.m., beginning se Wednesday, September 13th. Um, for now, you can speak with Dan or Cynthia for more, more details. All right, the Silver Saints Peach Cobbler Special. All Silver Saints, those are s 60 years and older. <laughs> yeah, what the hell was. Um, are invited to the home of Bob and Kathy Monroe at 7 p.m. this Friday night, September 8th, for a Peach Cobbler Social. Sounds delicious. Uh, if you'd like to take part, please visit the sign-up table to let them know you're coming. Young Married's Bible Study. Our bi-weekly Young Married's Bible Study resumes this month on Wednesday, September 13th at the home of Dennis and Judy Ulrich. We will begin at 6.30 p.m. and meet the second and fourth Wednesdays of each month. Come and join us for food, fellowship, and a great time of studying God's Word together. Child care is not provided at this time. If you have any questions, please speak with Dennis or Judy. Dinners for eight. Uh, they are here again. Stop by the dinners for eight table in the foyer and choose a date in September or October. These are always a great time of adult fellowship while enjoying a wonderful meal together. All right, we're looking for men and young men to help set up the children's ministry rooms back up for Sundays following our Thursday ladies Bible study. It will be about one hour of work and we need two men each week. So if you have a little free time, we would really appreciate some help getting this thing back together. Um, please visit the sign-up table to let us know if you can help. And if you have any questions, please speak with Jason or Terry. For additional details on ministries and upcoming events, you can check your bulletin or visit us online at our church website or our online community of the city. And let's stand as we continue in worship. For I 
thank you that those words are true, that, Lord, you have removed the power of sin from our lives, that you have canceled the debt that we would owe you, and you have nailed, Lord, as a, as a paid bill to your cross, that we can always look to that and know that you have paid what we could not, and, Lord, that we belong to you forever. Lord, we bless you. We praise you. Jesus, we honor you for your sacrifice and pray that you are glorified as we sing. We know, Lord, you are worthy worthy of our praise. We pray that you would receive those today. Bless your name, Jesus. Amen. And you may be seated as we continue in worship. Your blood Washed away my sin, Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus, thank you. Once you're in me, now seated at your table, Jesus, thank you. of the cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one crushed your son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away Thank you, the Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once you're in me, now seated at your table, Jesus. Perfect sacrifice I've been brought near Your enemy you've made your friend Pouring out the riches of your glorious grace Your mercy and your kindness know no end Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once you're in me, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Your blood 
blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, Oh 
be seated as we continue our worship by receiving this morning's tithes and offerings. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, come to you this morning ever thankful and ever grateful for all that you have done for us, Lord, and all that you continue to do, the blessings that you so richly pour out upon us, Lord. And as such, we would like to give back a portion of these, Lord. We, ta- that we pray that you would take these offerings and these tithes and use them for the furtherance of your kingdom, Lord, that they would be multiplied to just bring more and more people to come and know you, Lord. We thank you. We give you today. We pray just your blessing upon this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. John and Robert, thank you, and thank you, worship team. Wonderful. I was um, in here this week, and they came in to practice a few of these things, and 
You know, it's just wonderful that our worship team spends so much time practicing and getting this right. They put a lot into it, and uh, it's just amazing. I was standing behind John when he was doing the piano, and uh, I was just asking him, you know, how do you do that, John? And he just uh, says, well, I feel the notes, and I, I kind of just speak in Greek to me, but uh, and it's wonderful. Thank you, team. Uh, can you believe it's already September? <clears throat> this is amazing, isn't it? Uh, school has started for, for most of uh, the kids, and for the rest of us, we're thinking, Lord, bring the cool weather as soon as you can. Uh, so uh, <laughs> lots of amens there. So anyway, yes, very quickly moving through things. And um, <clears throat> Houston, uh, if you followed the news this last week, has been hit uh, with devastation. Um, the Hurricane Harvey came through and just m- slow moving, and so it dumped so much water on that city. They are kind of prepared for hurricanes there, out on the uh, coast especially. You know, they know they're going to get hit, but this came into the, uh, into the inner regions and just dumped 50 inches of water. Just to give you some sort of perspective, we get 12 inches on a good year, 12 inches of rain in one year. They got 50 in one week, in about four days. So lots of flooding, lots of damage. And many of you have asked, well, how can we help? What can we do? And so... Um, you can go to our website, and there are some places that you can go to, uh, to give, uh, if you, Lord has laid that on your heart, right to some um, ministries that are ministering right there in that area and feeding and proclaiming the gospel. And so that information is on our website, so just go there and have a look at that. Okay, um, Mike, <clears throat> I've got the, uh, some things up here that I want to show. Can we bring that up, if you would? If it makes the transition here. Okay, very good. All right, this is a aerial view of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So when we say Temple Mount, we're talking about this, this line right here all the way around. And it's not so obvious from an aerial view. There's important things that I want to show you from this angle. But you'll really notice it when you're down here on street level. You're looking up, oh, about 100 to 200 feet up here. So this whole area is really elevated and stands up. And there are two mosques on the Temple Mount that we'll be talking about. <clears throat> most uh, don't recognize that this is a mosque. And this is the most important mosque, Al-Aqsa Mosque. Everyone and their eye obviously goes to the Dome of the Rock Mosque because of the Golden Dome. But this is a mosque as well, and it's the more important one in the eyes of Islam. This is another aerial view that I wanted to show you. And I wanted to show you this one because um, right there, there's an open space on the the, uh, Temple Mount next to the Dome of the Rock Mosque. So the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Dome of the Rock. And we're looking from the east, by the way, if you like to orient yourself. This is north, kind of following this. So we're on the east side looking west. And there's this open space here. I'll show you another one. Maybe I'll turn it like this. If that helps, there we go. Okay, this whole area there on the north side of the Dome of the Rock is kind of an open space, and uh, maybe something could be built there someday, as we'll be talking about. And then one more, I have a, uh, this is a picture of the model, come on, there we go, of the temple. Now, there's no temple there today, right? But this is a model And for those of you going on the Israel trip, you will see this. All of Jerusalem built to scale during the time of Jesus. It's very fascinating. It's very fun to go in and look at how this whole thing is laid out. And that's what they feel pretty close to what the temple looked like on the Temple Mount. And those would have been the porticos there, all described in history, and then the temple. And then, of course, this outer court would be the court of the Gentiles, okay? And we're going to talk about all of those things this morning. I just wanted you to have a picture in your minds of what we were speaking about. All right, let's stand and open in our Bibles, <clears throat> in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. Revelation 11, verse 1, if you need a Bible... Be sure to raise your hands, and our ushers will get one to you. If you are visiting with us this morning, we're very glad that you're here today. We are studying all the way through the book of Revelation, and we find ourselves in chapter 11, verse 1. And I've entitled this message, The Two Witnesses, part 1. Let's read from verse 1 as John writes, and he says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. 
And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of, the pro of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. And to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. And thank you for the book of Revelation. Looking into the future. Telling us about things to come. Which lets us know, just intrinsically, if you can speak about things to come, then you are all-powerful, you are all-knowing, you are God, and you are worthy of our worship. And so we do that now, Lord. We bring our hearts and our minds to you. We just proclaim your goodness. We proclaim your greatness, your holiness, and that you are worthy of all of our worship. You are worthy of all the glory in heaven and in earth. There is no one like you. We thank you, Lord, for being our God, for calling us, for making us your children, for giving us salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, one of the themes that we've tried to drive home in the book of Revelation is that even in the midst of God's great justice and His judgments that He's pouring out upon the world, we see the tremendous mercy of God. We see God's mercy to people. God's mercy is concerned for the souls of men, that they would repent and turn away from their sin, and that they would know His forgiveness and His love they would know the gift of everlasting life. That is God's great concern. Remember that the Lord has already commissioned 144,000 witnesses to go forth and to testify of His grace, of His gospel, to call people to repentance, to explain this judgment that is falling upon the world to them. He called 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000 to go forth. They were an army of evangelists and preachers explaining to the world what was happening at this time. God's heart is for these people living during this time to recognize that these judgments are a punishment for sin, but that they can turn from their sin and they can know His forgiveness. And that is His great desire. But now we see here that the Lord gives two special witnesses to testify of his truth to the world, and they are simply called the two witnesses. That is their title. And these two witnesses have a very special ministry, and their ministry will be confirmed by signs and wonders from heaven, from the divine power of God and God alone, and he will confirm this to the world. So even as the judgments that God is pouring out upon the world are supernatural, so God will give a supernatural verification of the message of these two witnesses to the world. So there's correspondence. God says, I am judging the world in a very supernatural fashion, and I am going to confirm the message of these two witnesses supernaturally as well. But sadly, by and large, the world will not heed the message that these two witnesses preach. By and large, it will go rejected, unheeded by the audience listening to them. And that's the great tragedy of sinful man, isn't it? Not only is man lost, not only is mankind separated from God, but he rejects what God does tell him, and he runs the other way. He loves the darkness and not the light. The Bible says that mankind suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, it's not that there is not enough evidence for God. And how many of us have heard that? We hear that all the time, don't we? Well, I don't believe in God because there's just not enough evidence out there. If I can't see it in a telescope or put it under the microscope, then I just, I just can't believe it. It lacks evidence. Well, there's not a, 
lack of evidence at all god has given us creation and conscience we know that just from the created world that there is a creator we know from the design of this world that there is a designer it's that man takes the evidence and he suppresses it in wickedness because he does not want to believe sinful man lo loves his sin he loves the darkness and so he clings to his sinful pursuits and that's why essentially people refuse to come to christ because they know intrinsically that they will have to give something up they know that they will have to turn away from their sin they know that they will have to leave the darkness and come into the light jesus explained this point so perfectly to nicodemus in john chapter 3 remember that jesus said and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And there it is. There's the definitive understanding of why people don't come to Christ. Because they love the darkness, they love their sin. So when somebody tells me, or they tell you, as you've heard this, just like I have, well, you know, I have intellectual problems with the Christian faith. I can't really believe because I'm a man of science, I'm a man of thinking and logic. And I can't believe in a book that says that God created the world in seven days. I can't believe in a book that says that all of these animals got onto the ark and there was a great flood. I can't believe that the Red Sea was parted and the children of Israel walked across on dry ground. I can't believe that Jesus raised people from the dead or came out of the grave alive himself. You tell them, no, that's not true. The Bible tells us why you don't believe. You don't believe because you have a sin problem. You don't believe because you love the darkness more than the light. And so you ask them, and sometimes it's a very good question to ask, what sin are you holding on to that you will not come to the Lord, that you will not receive His forgiveness? That's the issue. Is it pride? Is it the fact that you will not surrender your own control of life to God? Is it that you will not admit that you are a sinner in need of God's grace? Is it greed? Are you living for material gain, always wanting more and more and more? Is it lust? What is it? There is some sin that you're holding on to, and that's why you do not come to the Lord. And that's why the gospel message is rejected, and that's why the world will reject these two witnesses and what they're saying. It's not for lack of confirmation. It's because they love the darkness more than the light. So John begins here by telling us that he was given a reed. Now, in that day, obviously, they didn't have measuring tapes or a measuring wheel like we have today to measure something. And so they would often take a reed, something very straight or a rod, and they would take that and they would reduce it to the, the exact size that they needed, and they would use that reed or that rod to measure something out. They would mark off its length precisely, and that would become the measuring unit. Now this angel stood and said to John, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But he tells him to leave the court that is outside of the temple out of the measurement. Do not measure that. Now in the time of Jesus, thinking back to the temple at that time, Jerusalem was a very international city and had a lot of travelers coming through. There was a lot of trade and commerce being done. And so Gentiles would come into the city of Jerusalem, and they were actually allowed to go up onto the Temple Mount. They were actually allowed to go and worship the Lord and give to the Lord, but they could only go so far. They were allowed into the outer court, which was called the Court of the Gentiles. They could not proceed any further. If they were to go any further, then there was a sign actually that said, if you go beyond this point, you will be executed. The Romans gave the Jews the power to defend the holiness of the temple. And so a Gentile could only go so far. So this angel, speaking to John here, tells him to measure the court, but not the outside court. Measure the temple, I should say, but not the outside court, because that has been given to the Gentiles. He's talking about the court of the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles will tread the holy city, speaking of Jerusalem, for 42 months. Now, 42 months, according to my best math, is three and a half years. Okay? So half the length of the tribulation. 
What we're speaking about here in the book of Revelation takes place over seven years. Seven-year tribulation, 42 months is half of that. Now, this command to measure the temple is not so that the Lord will know the measurements of the temple, right? It's not so the Lord is up there saying, well, I'm not really sure how big the temple is. Let's have John measure it off so I can know. No, that's not what's being done here. Actually, this is a type of designation, a singling out of the temple for special selection or purpose. So John is told to measure the temple very carefully, but to leave out the court of the Gentiles. Now, step back for a second. What does this tell us then about Jerusalem and what is located in Jerusalem during the tribulation? There's a temple there, isn't there? That's my power of deducement. I have deduced since the Lord said to measure this temple and to leave out the court of the Gentiles in the holy city that there is a temple during the time of the tribulation. It's interesting to us because Daniel in the Old Testament prophesied something very important about the Antichrist and the temple that would take place during the tribulation. Daniel said in nine, Daniel 9.27... Then he, that is the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now that's a great insight given by Daniel. There's going to be this leader who rises up. And Daniel was speaking 500 years even before Jesus. He was looking into the future. He was seeing a day even beyond us right now. And he says in that day, there will be this leader that rises up. And he will take control, and he will have a covenant with many. In fact, we will learn that it will be most of the world that will follow him. And in the middle of his rule, he will stand up, and he will put an end to the sacrifice and offerings of the Jews. Now, where does the Old Testament command the Jews to present their offerings and their sacrifices? At the temple, right? And the temple alone. You couldn't just go anywhere and do that. You couldn't go in your backyard and offer sheep and goats to the lord no that was not allowed you had to come to the temple and the temple alone and so daniel was telling us 500 years before jesus the same thing that G, that john is telling us here there is going to be a temple in jerusalem in the end times now today when you look at the city of jerusalem there's no temple there nowhere in jerusalem there is the Temple Mount, as we call it, that was built by Solomon and enhanced by Herod the Great. When you go to the Temple Mount today in Jerusalem, there are some very large stones on the bottom. I mean, massive stones. Like, they don't even know how they got them there. You just kind of scratch your, your head in awe. For anyone that has any sort of building experience, I remember the first time that I saw this thing, I was there with a contractor, and he's just staring at these stones. And he's just thinking, how, how could they move these stones into this place without any modern equipment? And they feel that these stones were actually put there by Solomon. Started there. And then Herod added on to it. Now the Temple Mount, the top of it, because of wars and conflicts, that's been torn down and rebuilt, but the base of it is still there the work of solomon so there's a temple mount but there is no temple on top of that mount today there are two mosques there the dome of the rock mosque and the al-aqsa mosque the al-aqsa mosque is the more significant mosque from islam's viewpoint but the dome of the rock mosque is what catches the eye because it has the golden dome on it now if the Jews today were to try to build a temple on the Temple Mount, World War III would break out right now. Literally. Every Islamic nation would rise up against Israel to fight against them. And since we are an ally of Israel, we would get involved. And since Russia is in Syria right now, an ally of Syria, an Islamic nation, they would get involved. And soon you would have, a, literally, a world war. So... All of the Islamic nations are very much against Israel, and they would not allow them to build a temple. Now, this has led to some speculation. It's not specifically stated in the Bible, but I think it's very good. That somehow and in some way, this great world leader that comes on the scene is going to achieve a type of peace to allow the Jews to once again build the temple upon the temple mount 
Apparently, he's going to negotiate a world, a world peace between Islam and Israel that will allow this to take place. And of course, today they're enemies, right? Israel has no greater enemy in the world than the Islamic nations. They're the ones that are constantly criticizing and fighting against Israel. They're the ones condemning Israel for the Palestinians and the West Bank and the settlements that are going on there. They are the ones that are bringing up resolutions in the United Nations to condemn Israel. And so sort of this infighting is going on, though Israel may be at peace right now, and there's not actual shooting. There's kind of like this boiling anger right below the surface. And it would appear from what we read here that there is going to be a temple built upon the Temple Mount once again, and that it will be put very close to these mosques. And the mosques will inhabit a portion, but it will be the outside, it will be the court of the Gentiles, the one that G John is told not to measure. And the temple will probably sit just north on that Temple Mount. Once again, we don't know, but that seems to, way, to be the way things are sizing up. Do you know that today, right now, there is a Temple Mount in Israel? There are also other groups that are forming, getting ready to build this temple. They've already got the plans in place. They've got artifacts and instruments and garments and artwork, and it's all coming together so that when they can, when the political opportunity presents itself, they can go up onto that Temple Mount and they can begin to build. They know right now that the political climate will not allow them to do that, but they are waiting and they are watching. Some have speculated that Israel will fall for the Antichrist and they will receive him as their Messiah precisely because he is the one to allow them to build the temple someday. And this will take some sort of political genius, right? To bring that kind of peace to the world? To allow the Jews to go up onto that temple mount and to build that temple? And so there's a feeling, a sense that Israel will look at that individual and say, Aha, this is the chosen one. This must be the Messiah because he has allowed us to do something that would be otherwise impossible. This is the miraculous. And so this political achievement of this great leader will cause Israel to receive this man as their Messiah. And then we read in verse 3, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Now, because this is mentioned in accordance with the temple, it appears that the ministry of these two witnesses is centered right there in Jerusalem, on the temple mount, at the temple itself. And the Lord says that he will give power to these two witnesses. In other words, he will give his power mighty power, holy, miraculous power to them, and they will minister 1,260 days. Now, once again, that's three and a half years, half the length of the tribulation. So fully one half of the tribulation, when the Lord is pouring his judgments out upon the earth, these two witnesses will be there at the temple, and they will serve as a testimony of God, calling people to repentance, and explaining all of the judgments that are happening to the world for one half of the length or duration of the tribulation. And basically, they're calling the world to repent. They're explaining to the world what God is doing and how they can escape these judgments of God. And we learn here that they will be wearing sackcloth. They'll be wearing sackcloth, which is a very coarse and uncomfortable material, very much like our burlap. Have you seen a burlap sack, you know, one of these things? Um, they wouldn't be very comfortable to wear, would it? You know, I like cotton. Cotton is nice, you know. Cotton feels good. But burlap, not so much. It's irritating, it's scratchy, wouldn't want to wear that. And that's what these prophets will be wearing. In other words, these prophets are in the Old Testament vein. They're not going to be driving sports cars and living in expensive, expensive condos and wearing Italian suits. No, these guys will come, live sacrificially before the people, and they will cry out, just like an Old Testament prophet did, to turn away from their sin and to come to the Lord. Now, three and a half years that we see here correspond to the rise of the Antichrist and his turning against the nation of Israel. And it appears from Scripture initially that once again, probably due to the building of the temple, that Israel will 
will embrace this man as their leader. But then something happens in the middle of his reign where he will put an end to the sacrifice and the offering. And it will stop. It will cease. This is also something that was prophesied by Daniel in Daniel 9.27. He said, And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So David, or Daniel, spoke of this time. And Daniel said, He shall be one of abominations that makes desolate. Now Jesus spoke of this in his ministry as well. In the New Testament, some 500 years later, after Daniel the prophet had written, Jesus spoke of the abomination of desolation. Okay? Quoting Daniel. The abomination of desolation. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, Therefore, speaking to Israel, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place... Whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Who's in Judea? The Jews are in Judea. When you see this thing take place in your land, in Jerusalem, at the temple, the abomination of desolations, flee, run, get out of there. So this three and a half years that we're reading about is associated with the Antichrist, turning against Israel, persecuting the Jews, and with the Antichrist causing the abomination of desolation. Now, what is that? Well, we feel very solidly that this will be the time when the Antichrist presents himself as God to be worshipped. And that will be the abomination of desolation. And Jesus says, when you see that, run. Escape as quickly as you can. Now, we'll cover much more about the Antichrist and about all of this later in the following chapters. Verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Now remember, John is writing this, and John has a tremendous understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. Now when you and I read this, and the first time that you probably read that, you skipped right over it, you didn't think anything about it. I mean, what two olive trees and what lampstands? I would think for most of us, when you read that, it doesn't really stand out. There's no file that we have that you would go to to say, oh, there it is, the two olive trees and the two lampstands. It would just be easy to pass right over that verse. But this is from an Old Testament passage in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4. Back in the Old Testament, Zechariah the prophet was having a vision, and there was an angel speaking to him. And in this vision, Zechariah saw two olive trees and two lampstands. In Zechariah 4.11, he says this, speaking to the angel, what are these two olive trees at the right hand of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my lord. So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. These are the two anointed ones that stand beside the Lord of the earth. So Zechariah in the Old Testament has this incredible vision. And he sees these two olive trees and these two lampstands. And somehow he knows in his vision that these olive trees represent someone, somebody, people. And so he asks the angel, Who are these olive trees? What am am I seeing here? Who are they? And the angel says, Do you not know who they are? And he says, No, I don't. Who are they? These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord. And here in the book of Revelation, at the very end of the Bible, the Lord identifies these as the two witnesses. Here they show up again, from the Old Testament right here into the book of Revelation. And so it's all tied together. These are the two olive trees that Zacharias saw in his vision 500 years before Christ. So who are they in particular? Well, let's read further. Verse 5. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. 
Okay, so now we see these supernatural signs and miracles that accompany the ministry of these two witnesses. So these two witnesses are speaking. They're crying out in Jerusalem there. People are hearing them. They're preaching. And then along with their ministry come these supernatural signs and wonders. And so we see that the Lord is so good, He is so merciful to authenticate their message, to verify it supernaturally. These are not just crazy people up on the Temple Mount wearing sackcloth and speaking out. You know, when I was a kid, you had to go to big cities to see crazy people. They just didn't exist in little towns. Maybe they did, but they were well-behaved, I think. So, you know, my family, we would go to San Francisco for the day, and uh, we like to do that as a family. And, you know, my brother and I were young, and you'd, you'd always be watching out for the crazy people. And you'd see crazy people walking along the streets and sort of speaking to themselves and just, you know, kind of saying things. Now we've advanced, and we've brought them here into the valley. They're right here with us. And it's sad because so often these people have just, they've lost their minds with drugs and alcohol and just basically living in sin. The other day I was eating lunch here downtown and a, a woman came walking by and she was just crying out in filth and horrible language, but just yelling at somebody or something. That's not going to be these two witnesses. There may be a temptation to think, okay, yeah, they're crazy men. But then the Lord gives authenticating signs and miracles to say, no, no, they're not crazy. They're preaching with a purpose. And I, the God of heaven, am verifying what they are saying. And so they will have this ability to do incredible miracles. You know, when Jesus came on the scene, he made some pretty big claims, didn't he? Jesus said he was the Son of God. Now, when you make a big claim, you got to back it up, don't you? you got to put your money where your mouth is, as we say in our vernacular, don't we? If you're going to make a claim like that, you better back it up. And Jesus did, didn't he? Jesus did miracle after miracle to show that he is indeed who he said he is. He calmed the wind and the waves. The storm listened to him. He cast out demons. He cleansed the lepers. The people that were sick were brought to him, and all of them were healed. Not just the easy cases. Not just a few of them. Every single person with any sort of infirmity brought to Jesus was healed on the spot instantaneously. Jesus raised people from the dead, and he resurrected out of the grave himself. And so Jesus' miracles and his signs proclaimed the power, the majesty, and the glory of God so that people would understand, yes, he is who he said he is. He is God in the flesh. Nicodemus understood this. Remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3 coming to Jesus? He sort of spilled the beans. He sort of gave it all away. He came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Sign of great respect, because Nicodemus was the teacher in Israel, and he calls Jesus rabbi. He says, Rabbi, uh, we know that you're from God. We, the Pharisees, we know that you're from God, because no one could do the things that you do unless they were from God. So he gave it away. We know that your miracles and your great works confirm that you are someone from God. In other words, there was no dispute in their minds. Though the Pharisees persecuted Jesus, though they did not believe in him as God, they knew that something was going on there supernatural. So the same thing is happening here with these two witnesses. In the middle of God's great and supernatural judgment upon the earth, he gives the ability of these two witnesses to do great signs and miracles for all to see. And all of it, without exception, don't miss this, is to bring people to repentance did god have to send these two witnesses no he didn't he could have just poured his judgments out upon the earth he could have just said all right for all of these years all of creation you've lived in rebellion to me you've lived in great sin against me you've done all of these things to harm one another and go against my word i'm just going to level the place but he doesn't he gives two witnesses to cry out to the world telling them to turn away from their sin and to explain why these judgments are coming upon the earth. That is God's heart for his creation. That is God's heart for you and me, that we might know his grace and his mercy. Now, as you can imagine, the world is not really a happy place in the middle of the tribulation, as we've been speaking about. At this point, the world has suffered greatly. 
all of these supernatural judgments that have been poured out upon the heavens and the earth really have destroyed much of the planet. We've talked about the punishing demons that have been turned loose. We've talked about the disease and the famine and the warfare everywhere. And by my calculation, at this point in the tribulation, one half of the world's population has died by the judgment of God. So when these witnesses, these two witnesses, appear in Jerusalem at the temple and they begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope of forgiveness, and the very reason that God's judgments are being poured out upon the world, uh, they're not going to be very well received. People will not want to hear what they have to say. The New York Times is not going to hold them in high esteem. The CNN news channel is not going to do an expose on their lives and a segment on their families and where they came from. They will be hated. They will be rejected. It's just like with Jesus and with all of the prophets. The world is going to hate them for their message. The world is going to hate them for their truth claims. And when the world's authorities do approach them and try to stop them from speaking and try to shut them up, they will use these supernatural judgments of God to defend themselves. You know, even today, though we have the protection of freedom of speech in our Constitution, quite often, if you go and preach the gospel somewhere, increasingly, you're being shut down. The police are just saying, you can't do that here. It's causing a disturbance. It looks like the same thing will happen here. They begin to preach. They begin to explain to the world what's happening. They begin to explain the need for repentance and turning away from your sin. And the world will say, okay, let's shut them up. Let's put a stop to it. And I imagine, once again, this is not in the Bible, my own active imagination. I imagine these two witnesses will say, listen, we've got to preach this message. Don't try and stop us. We're from the Lord, and we've got a message to proclaim. Don't come near us and try to apprehend us or arrest us, because then we will have to defend ourselves. And the authorities will say, yeah, right. And they will defend themselves. And we see here that fire will literally proceed out of their mouths and devour those who come against them. And we see that they will have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls. And we see that they will have the power to turn water into blood and the power to strike the earth with great plagues. Now, where have you seen this before? It's all in the Old Testament, isn't it? This has already happened. Sometimes critics can look at these judgments and say, oh, this has got to be symbolic. These, th these kind of things would never happen. Uh, not only would they happen, but they have already happened. They are already there listed for us. For instance, Elijah was a great prophet of God, wasn't he? And Elijah had a tremendous ministry in the Old Testament. On one occasion, there was a wicked king by the name of Ahaziah. And he didn't like Elijah so much and he said, I'm going to arrest that man. I'm going to incarcerate him. I don't like the things that he's saying. I don't like all of this trouble that, is, that has occurred because of him. And he commissioned a captain and 50 men to go and arrest Elijah. So this captain, poor captain, I was a captain at one time. I would not want this, uh, this duty. He took his 50 men in obedience to the king and he went out to find Elijah. And he came to this high place where Elijah was and he called out to him, are you the man of God? And Elijah said, yes, I am the man of God. He says, man of God, you come down here right now. You're under arrest, and I'm going to take you back to the king. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume all of you. And literally, fire came down from heaven and incinerated all of them on the spot. Wow. It's impressive, isn't it? Well, Ahaziah the king did not learn the lesson. So he commissioned another captain and 50 men. I would not want to be in that assignment at all. He commissioned another captain and 50 men. You go get Elijah and you bring him back here to me. And so he went and he found Elijah again on the high place. And he said, are you? Same thing, round two. Are you the man of God? Why, yes, I am. You come down here, man of God. You come with me. You're under arrest and I'm taking you back to the king. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you. And once again, incinerated the captain and 50 men. Ahaziah the king is not a bright boy. He can't get it here. So he commissions another captain and 50 men. Go get Elijah. This isn't working so well. But this was a different captain, a different kind of man. And he saw Elijah up on a high place. And instead of calling out to him in pride, he fell down before him. And he said, oh, Elijah, have mercy on me. Let my life be precious in your sight. 
And so he was humbled before him, and actually Elijah did come and go with him. That's another story. It's a great story. But Elijah in the Old Testament had power to call fire down from heaven. Once again, people can look at this in the book of Revelation and say, well, this must be symbolic. These kinds of things can't happen. They already have happened. You either reject it all or you receive it all. If God could use Elijah to call fire down from heaven in the Old Testament, he can do it in the book of Revelation as well. Now, who in the Old Testament had the ability to strike water and turn it to blood? Who had been given by God the ability to call great plagues down on Egypt? Well, that was Moses, right? Moses called ten plagues down onto Egypt. One of them was to strike the water and turn it to blood. So once again, Revelation is describing here what has already happened in the Bible. Sometimes people will read this and they'll treat it so fantastically. Oh, that's so far out there. It's already happened. Now this has led many to believe that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. Remember that Moses and Elijah were the ones that appeared with Jesus on the Mount of, of Transfiguration when Jesus went up there with Peter, James, and John, and he was transfigured in his glory, it was Moses and Elijah that appeared with him in glory. The law and the prophets were right there with Jesus, and there was no problem, no conflict. They were in perfect harmony, right? Sometimes people want to make a problem between the law and grace. Nope, they were right there with Jesus. Moses and Elijah both died in very unique ways, didn't they? Moses, remember, he was taken up onto Mount Nebo by God, and he was actually buried by him. Men did not bury Moses, but God did. And of course, Elijah didn't die at all. He was caught up by a fiery chariot and taken right to heaven. Speaking of Elijah, the Lord said at the end of the Old Testament in Malachi 4, 5, the very end, as the Old Testament closes out, the Lord said, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The Lord said, Elijah is coming again. But, I have to admit, the Bible does not give the names of these two witnesses. Many people feel that this is Moses and Elijah. But I can't say for sure. It's good to have an opinion. I hope you do have an opinion. Just don't fight about it. We can't be dogmatic about it because we are not given the names. I've heard many people feel that one of these prophets, or one of these witnesses may be Enoch. Because remember, he did not die in the Old Testament. He was taken to be with the Lord. So we're not sure, but those are some likely candidates for the two witnesses. Now, there's something that I want you to take away from this. There's something that I want you to see from these, the ministry of these two witnesses. What we see here is the incredible patience of God. The incredible patience patience and long suffering of God. We see incredibly how God waits literally for millennia before judging the world. So often people will get a little glimpse of revelation and the judgments of God and they'll say, "Oh, that God is such an angry judgmental God." No. Look how long he has waited before he judges. These two witnesses, those who stood beside the Lord, were presented all the way back in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah, 500 years before Jesus. And the Lord waits for more than 2,500 years, and still waiting because we don't know when this is going to take place, before He inaugurates their ministry, before He judges the world. This is what the Bible calls long-suffering. Our God is long-suffering. He is patient. It's a word that is used over and over again to describe the Lord. Remember that Moses wanted to see the glory of God, and he asked the Lord, Lord, I want to see your glory. And the Lord said, Moses, you can't see my face and live. No one can see my face and live, not in my full glory. But I'll do this, Moses. I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put my hand over the rock, and I'll cause all of my goodness and glory to pass in front of you, and then I will take my hand away, and you can see the afterglow of me going by. And the Lord said to Moses, while he was passing by at that moment, in Exodus 34, 6, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. That's what the Lord said about himself. I am abounding in goodness and truth. I am long-suffering. 
Every single day, this world mocks God. It curses God. It deprives God of the worship and the gratitude that he deserves. Every single day, this world sins against its neighbor, harming, stealing, abusing, and killing the most helpless and and weakest among us. And yet the Lord waits. He waits patiently, calling out to people to be saved. He is long-suffering. He's exceedingly patient toward this world, and we need to understand that attribute of God. Because the world continually accuses God of being cruel and unjust, doesn't it? And we have to hear it. And this is a great place to say, no, wait a second. Don't say that about my God. He is very long-suffering. He is very loving. He's very kind. He has every right to judge sin in a moment's notice. But he goes on, calling out for people to be saved. You know, if you're here this morning, and you've never come fully to the Lord, you've never come and confessed that you are a sinner in need of salvation today is the day god is waiting for you god is long suffering the lord's judgment will not be stayed forever the judgment is coming and we preach that because that's what the bible says but right now we're living in the age of grace right now this is the time of mercy and the lord is saying come to me and receive my mercy receive my grace so that you may be saved and never become the object of my wrath the lord waits patiently for us that we might know Him in everlasting life and forgiveness. You know, the Bible tells us that the goodness of God leads us to repentance. How important it is that we stop for a moment and realize the goodness of God, that that's what leads us to repentance. We live in a world that is hopelessly confused and contradicted. They can't agree with anything, can they? If you read the news, you know that. I mean, look at how many Supreme Court decisions have been decided five to four. You've got the greatest experts, supposedly, in the Constitution appointed to that bench. I don't think they're the best experts, but anyway, nonetheless, they are on that bench. And how many decisions are decided? Five to four. Five of them say, absolutely, that's constitutional. And four of them saying, absolutely not. That is not constitutional. We are a divided and contradicted world. But there is a God that has no contradiction. He is the one who created you and me. He is the one that holds our very breath in his hands, and he is calling to you and me by name. He knows your name, and he is calling out to us to come to him and to receive his love, to receive his forgiveness, to receive his gift of everlasting life. God is long-suffering, and he patiently waits for us. Receive the goodness of God and allow the goodness of God to lead you to repentance that you would never know his judgment. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. If the worship team would come forward, and let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Even for a section like this in Revelation chapter 11, speaking of your two witnesses, of what it tells us about you, and the great God and Father that you are, Lord, you have every right to judge mankind for his sin immediately. Lord, you had every right to snuff out the life of Adam and Eve because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You told them in the day that they eat of that, they would surely die. And yet they ate of it, and you made their death slowly. They began to die, but they did not die immediately. Adam lived over 900 years. It's just a picture of your mercy and your grace. And Lord, even now, the world mocks you, it curses you, and you still do not judge. You're still calling out to people. I pray that everyone in this room would understand that. They would know and hear your call. They would recognize the work that your Holy Spirit is doing in their hearts right now by the conviction of the word, and that you are calling them to come to you and to receive your grace by faith. And so, Lord, I pray that that would be true for all of us here, that no one would reject your goodness and that all would see you according to the scripture, that you are a long-suffering, good God, full of mercy and grace. We thank you that, Lord, that's who you are. We thank you for being the great God that we get to serve. And Lord, we ask for your blessing upon today. We ask your blessing upon this week, upon this congregation, Lord, that we would live for you, that we would know you, and that we would serve you according to the light, and that we, being used by you, would call people out of the darkness 
and into the light. Lord, thank you for being such a wonderful God. Thank you for being so good and so gracious to us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you're here today and you're outside of the grace of God, you've never come to God's grace, recognize that He is a long-suffering God and you need to be in that grace. Come to Him today. Come and have a seat up front after the service and we will pray with you and we will explain what it means to receive the grace of God.